Will Azerbaijan take full control of Nagorno-Karabakh? Armenian separatists in the region agree to disarm after a quick assault by Baku. They're also considering reintegrating into Azerbaijan. So, is this the end of this decades-long conflict? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. In only 24 hours of fighting, Azerbaijan has changed the facts on the ground in Nagorno-Karabakh. A new ceasefire with ethnic Armenian groups appears to put the country's forces in full control of the region. Azerbaijan and Armenia have battled over the enclave for decades, but this time Armenia kept out of the fighting, leaving ethnic Armenian groups in the region to fend for themselves. In the coming months, the future of those groups will be decided along with their integration into the Azerbaijani state. We'll go to our panel in just a few moments, but first, Fintan Monahan has this report. After a lightning offensive, Azerbaijan now says it's in full control of Nagorno-Karabakh. Ethnic Armenians in the disputed region agreed to lay down their weapons and disband their forces. As a result of the start of the anti-terrorist measures, Azerbaijan has restored its sovereignty. The events that occurred yesterday and today at the same time will have a positive impact on the peace process between Armenia and Azerbaijan. I want to hope that our steps, the results of anti-terrorist measures, will eliminate the obstacles that were put forward, express, propose, call it what you want, from the Armenian side. And this will create a new reality, long-term peace in the South Caucasus. The enclave is internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan. But large parts were controlled by ethnic Armenians with close links to the Armenian government. Two wars have been fought over Nagorno-Karabakh since the fall of the Soviet Union. The last full-scale conflict in 2020 saw Azerbaijan make sizable gains. In Armenia, the latest defeat sparked protests. Many say ethnic Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh were abandoned. They want Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan to stand down. Pashinyan says the Armenian military wasn't involved in the latest fighting or the ceasefire process. We hope the military escalation will not continue because stability is very important for future projects. Thousands of Russian peacekeepers failed to stop the fighting. They helped evacuate around 10,000 ethnic Armenian civilians. Now they'll monitor the new ceasefire. As Azerbaijan seeks to reintegrate the region and its people. Fintan Monahan for Inside Story. All right, for more on all this, I'm joined by our guests. In Istanbul is Esmira Jafarova, board member of the Center of Analysis of International Relations. She's a former Azerbaijan diplomat and advisor to the Minister of Energy. In Yerevan is Arsen Haratyan, editor-in-chief of Alik Media, an Armenian-Georgian media platform. He's also the former foreign policy advisor to the Armenian prime minister. Also in Istanbul is Matthew Bryza, former U.S. mediator to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. He's the former U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Asmira, let me start with you today. Uh, Azerbaijan now intends to bring Nagorno-Karabakh under full control. Will they be able to do that? How easy or difficult will that be? Well, thank you very much, first of all, first of all for the invitation. And, uh, you know, Azerbaijan conducted a short uh, anti-terrorist operation. We call it local precise anti-terrorist operation, which is aimed at only the legitimate military targets, provided uh, that uh, no civilian objects were even uh, uh, harmed or were the objects of the operation. And the reason of that was that uh, recently, two days ago, seven Azerbaijani policemen were killed as a result of the landmine explosion that were planted in the liberated Azerbaijani land via the infiltration of the Armenian forces after the war was all over. So we have been warning about this threat for a long time and also about the existence of the uh, around 10,000 militias, Armenian militias in the liberated Azerbaijani lands, but they were all gone unheeded. So as a result of all these events happening one after another, Azerbaijan decided to embark on this short local anti-terrorist operation. And uh, you know that today there was a meeting with the representatives of the Karabakh Armenians in Yevlakh, and uh, there were some agreements reached between Azerbaijan representative and uh, the representatives of the Karabakh Armenians in Yevlakh, and among mm. others, were 
the uh, commitment and uh, abiding by the uh, agreement of the ceasefire that was reached yesterday. And mm. one of those uh, results, agreements, uh, clauses in that agreement was that the militias has to visit the disarm and has to disarm, has to go through the disarmament. And after that, of course, uh, there is a, uh, also a clause about the discussion of the flight mm. and the rights and the conditions of the Karabakh Armenians. So all these issues were discussed today, and this is only the first meeting. So there is an agreement about the follow-up meeting as well. Mm. And there was a request put by the Karabakh Armenians towards our representative, and one of them was to uh, uh, satisfy their need for fuel and for humanitarian aid. And those needs were uh, met with satisfaction. So mm. there will be a follow-up contact with Karabakh Armenians and Azerbaijan. So uh, uh, what I'm saying is this, yes. Yeah, this, it's Mira, uh, actually, let, 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 sorry to interrupt you. Let, let me just get back into some of those details uh, in depth with you uh, shortly. I, I also want to turn to Arsen right now. Uh, Arsen, I want to ask you about the fact that uh, Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan has said that the Armenian military was not involved in the latest fighting and that they're not involved or they had not been involved in the ceasefire process. Um, what does that mean going forward? Does that mean that he has accepted the outcome of this? Well, first of all, thank you again uh, on my end for inviting to the show. Uh, I mean, uh, not only the prime minister announced that Armenian military was not present in Karabakh, and everybody knows that that's been true for the last two years. As of uh, the summer of 2021, there was no Armenian military whatsoever. It was all taken out. Russian peacekeepers have been there watching it. Azerbaijanis have been controlling it very, very tightly, so they know that. I will have to address the two points that uh, our colleague uh, Esmira has, has has pointed out, talking about um, not not touching civilians. I mean, we have over 200 people dead, of which including civilians and children. Over 400 people injured. People are. I mean, the whole world has been seeing how Stepanakert has been shelled and bombed. Uh, villages have been destroyed. People have been evacuated outside of their homes. So, I mean, I, I don't even know how how you you guys are talking about not attacking or not. Targeting targeting civilians, uh, but uh, talking about the Armenian military or Armenia's involvement, Armenia has said that it's not going to go into war with Azerbaijan. Uh, however, it's open for receiving people who would like to leave. From what I can understand now from Armenia and from our contacts in Karabakh, the situation is so dire that I, I think 80 percent of the population would leave the place right away coming to Armenia. Uh, well, basically because they, they don't have anything. They don't have electricity, they don't have um, food, they don't have basic supplies. Now, with regards to the meeting uh, today between Karabakh Armenians and Azerbaijani officials, uh, it was the first meeting. As we all heard, uh, Karabakh Armenians announced that um, there were several points where they had no agreement. I don't know how it's going to go move forward. Azerbaijan is announcing this is one of many. We don't even hear what exactly were the Karabakh Armenians were offered. Mm. I don't think anybody had any um, uh, basically confidence in uh, possibly living under Azerbaijani rule after the, the day mm. of attack on various fronts in Karabakh. And if our colleagues from Azerbaijan are actually genuine about any kind of integration or dialogue, uh, they should stop killing our civilians and the population in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Matthew, what we've seen transpire in the past couple of days, uh, from your vantage point, does that mean the end of this decades-long conflict? I mean, is that what we're seeing here, essentially? I think so. I mean, I've been working on trying to mediate this conflict since 2001. And uh, there have been moments where there seemed to be progress and then backtracking. But the progress was always toward coming up with a framework, a theoretical framework to settle the conflict. In this case, that framework was established already now uh, through the ceasefire statement of November 9 and 10, 2020, after the Second Karabakh War. There was an obstacle in moving from that framework to a final peace treaty. We never talked about a peace treaty in the past. Now, a peace treaty, I think, is definitely within sight. Um, the, you know, the, the, the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, the U.S. Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, have been, have been leading one mediation process. The Russians have as well, of their own. And I, I think what was really the big problem that was blocking the finalization of a peace treaty has been the presence of weapons and call them Karabakh uh, militia or the Azerbaijanis call them Armenian forces. In any case, as long as those military capabilities were there, there was a temptation by extremists who oppose Pashinyan in Armenia, who don't want a, a settlement, 
to be able to put a lot of pressure on him. And also that military presence served as an irritant for the Azerbaijani side and undermined any sense of trust. With that military presence gone, uh, I, I don't see any serious obstacle to a peace treaty uh, except Pashinyan's own survival physically and politically uh, because he has some very strong opponents now in Yerevan who, who can't believe that he didn't uh, bring Armenia on the side of the Karabakh Armenians. Uh, Esmira, um, one of the big questions right now is how is Azerbaijan going to handle the issue of the ethnic Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh? Um, you were talking a little earlier about details of the plan thus far. From your vantage point, how to go forward uh, with that? Because in Yerevan, we've seen that there have been protesters that have voiced fears that Azerbaijan might be poised to launch a crackdown on ethnic Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. First of all, if I may address the points that were raised by, by our Armenian guests beforehand. Uh, you know, when the military operation started, there was an SMS notification sent to all representatives, all uh, uh, civilians living in Karabakh, in order to uh, make sure that they are evacuated. And Azerbaijani authorities also worked with the Russian peacekeepers in the cases of evacuation of the civilians from those areas. And the humanitarian corridors were also created for them. So uh, the problem is that Armenia created and located their military uh, fortification near the inhabitant areas. So uh, maybe there could have been some collateral damage, but those numbers are very, very inflated. So I wouldn't really go with those numbers along. So we took all the measures of precautions against any civilian law. So that's that. And the second issue is about the presence of militias that uh, Mr. Baiza raised. And that was a number one security threat to Azerbaijan. And they liberated Azerbaijani lands, reintegration of Karabakh Armenians. And listen, also, this is the number. Uh, there is a human dimension also to this issue. Uh, 7,500 Azerbaijanis cannot go back to the liberated lands because of the landmine threat because of the existence of the illegal militias in those territories. And nobody is ever talking about that. So uh, again, if we're talking about human rights issues, human dimension, we should also not really turn blind eye to the plight of Azerbaijanis that were expelled from those territories 30 years ago. And back to your question, what Azerbaijan is uh, planning to do in order to reintegrate this, these people, the Karabakh Armenians, to Azerbaijani society, we have raised and reached out to them on a number of occasions. And mm. it was only first meeting uh, between Azerbaijani authorities and, and uh, Karabakh Armenians back in Khan Kandy. Uh, a couple of months ago, but then they refused another meeting invitation because the separatist forces in Armenia, they, was just, they were just dragging them down and preventing their meeting with Azerbaijani authorities. And the meeting in the Revlakh that happened currently, it was also uh, planned to be before this meeting, before the military operation started. Mm. But they also refused to come to this meeting. So, you know, we didn't have to go through this, uh, let's say, violence or military uh, operations in order to reach out to Karabakh Armenians for the dialogue. We have been reaching out to them and, and extending our hands of conversation and dialogue to them for a long time, but they were backed down and kept back by the mm. separatist forces. But under these uh, conditions, now they agreed to talk. Uh, they are the plans that Azerbaijani authorities are putting forward for their reintegration, for their cultural rights, for their educational rights. And this is all under, uh, under discussion. And mm. I'm sure that uh, the both sides could find common ground uh, during the forthcoming meetings, because this is only the first meeting. And I'm sure mm. there should be more meetings to come. Uh, Arsen, I can see that you want to jump in. I'm going to let you do that. But I also have to ask you about something that Matthew brought up. Matthew talked about the fact that what has happened in Nagorno-Karabakh has brought some peril to the potentially the political survival of the Armenian prime minister. And I, I want to ask you about that because on Wednesday you had thousands of protesters taking to the streets of Yerevan. Um, they demanded the resignation of the prime minister for his handling of this crisis. I mean, how much does this imperil him politically? Uh, I mean, it's definitely having an impact domestically, no doubt about it. People are, um, you know, some of the people who are originally from Karabakh who ended up losing their homes and and, and, and were evacuated or, or moved to Armenia are have legitimate anger. Uh, there are also political forces oftentimes linked to uh, external parties. There are, uh, of course, people who are angry with this government and they're, 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 they're in the streets. They, they, they were protests even today. Uh, we'll talk about possible uh, political survival. I mean, Matt mm. was talking about physical survival. I don't know about that, but we'll see. Uh, but, but I'll have to get back to that. I mean, uh, I mean, can we not actually stop, can we stop fabricating stories? I mean, nobody was given a humanitarian corridor. For the last 10 months, Azerbaijan has been blockading Nagorno-Karabakh. We had people dying out of starvation. People couldn't get out of Karabakh 
for their medical needs. Azerbaijan, a couple of months ago, two months ago, started talking about, yeah, sure, no problem. We can open the Ahdam route and you can use Azerbaijani territory. The amount of hatred that Karabakh Armenians are hearing about themselves, the amount of anti-Armenian notions that we know exist in Azerbaijan, obviously there is enmity between the societies in general. I'm not talking about just Azerbaijan. That's true, but we're talking about hearing that we're being compared to cats and animals. We're, we're, we're constantly hearing that you either reintegrate, forced, forced integration, or you have to basically make your choices. So right now, in this level of rhetoric, both on the state-led televisions, on the official levels, I mean, how do you imagine Karabakh or Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians getting along and saying, you know what, it all didn't happen. We know you're now great. We can live with you. Give us some rights and we'll get mm. along with that. My understanding and what we see from here right now, Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians are not only, uh, I mean, fighting for their own lives on daily mm. and hourly basis. Uh, but uh, have no trust and confidence in any possible cohabitation, which I think in the long run is a huge mistake that Azerbaijan is making. I think before we can talk about any form of integration or reintegration, mm. there must be some kind of a dialogue, there must be a reconciliation process. There must be a long process of discussing how we can actually imagine living together, uh, let alone uh, just being reintegrated by force. I mean, uh, as, as uh, with regards to Armenia proper, I think yes, the next days, the next couple of days, we'll see what happens. Mm. We do see that some kind of a connection between these attacks in Karabakh and the protests in Yerevan. We also see, obviously, the big boy uh, in the in the in the neighborhood in the region, uh, Russia being having the peacekeepers on the ground and being unable or unwilling to actually take care of or or or, or mm. uh, implementing their mandate and. Uh, in, Arsene, in many Arsene I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I do want to ask you more about, about Russia's role in this uh, shortly. Uh, I do want to go to Matthew. Matthew, I saw you reacting uh, to some of what Arsene was saying there, so I'm going to give you the opportunity to respond now. Please go ahead. Sure. Well, in all these 21 years, I talked about working on the Karabakh uh, issue in the White House, in the State Department, with President Aliyev, the current president's father, with this current president, with the Armenian side. Um, the president of Azerbaijan has consistently said that Azerbaijan's goal is the reintegration of the Armenian community into Azerbaijan at the end of this process. He was consistent throughout the Second Karabakh War. He's consistent now. Uh, and I, so I, I really believe that is the goal. And I also, though, agree with Arsen that um, simply you can't flip a switch and say, OK, everybody's integrated because the law says that you're Azerbaijani citizens. Um, there needs to be this long dialogue. There needs to be uh, what, what Asmira was talking about, the guarantees for the protection of the cultural, the economic, the political rights, the security of the ethnic Armenian community. It will take a long time to work through those issues and to build the requisite trust. Uh, but the process perhaps began today with that meeting in Yevlak. It'll take a while, but but it's underway. Uh, Esmira, um, with regard to the, the meetings that have been taking place in Yevlakha, do you expect that Russia will be heavily involved in, in talks going forward? Well, thank you very much. First of all, if I may quickly react to Armenian representative's words. You know, uh, I, nobody said that this reintegration has to happen by force. And that's definitely were not my words. And I fully subscribe to what Najib Reis has said, that it has to be a dialogue. That was what I was talking about. It has to be a process. And nobody expects these two... And nations that have lived apart in so animos animosity for a decade to just reintegrate into each other overnight. So it is a process, it is a dialogue, but we do not want Armenian proper or Armenian nationalist or revanchist forces to infiltrate and to uh, hinder this process. That is what is happening. They don't want, and they used to prevent the Armenian Armenians of Karabakh from getting into dialogue with Azerbaijan. That was also the problem. So, um, therefore, I wouldn't uh, wish to want to be uh, you said or an I said debate, but also about Lachin Corridor. Azerbaijan was offering Khankandi, Ardan Khankandi road for a long time. However, this road was blocked by concrete from the separatists. They didn't want to get any aid through this road because they just wanted to Lachin corridor to operate without any checkpoints because that was easier to bring in the militias and uh, the landmines into Azerbaijani territories and then create problems to Azerbaijan's security. And then there was an agreement reached on 1st of September that the both roads should have been opened simultaneously, which was also, again, talked at by Armenian side. 
So as you see, we have been extending lots of uh, uh, proposals and lots of ideas of cooperation. However, they were all blocked because Armenia was pre was preventing and they just wanted uh, win or lose uh, solutions. So they just wanted Agdam uh, Road closed mm. and Lachin Road open without any checkpoints. So that didn't happen. But now both roads are operating simultaneously. And this is what Azerbaijan was proposing in the first place. Mm. Um, what about uh, Russia's role? Well, you know, um, Russia has peacekeepers in the place. And Azerbaijan was cooperating with them when it came to the security, provision of security of the Karabakh Armenians in the areas where the Russian peacekeepers were temporarily deployed. Uh, what, whether they will be the part of the dialogue with the Karabakh Armenians or not, again, this is uh, not something that we would like to discuss with the presence of the third parties. We would like to talk to Karabakh Armenians who are our citizens directly mm. and discuss their problems and ourselves, which happened actually today. So uh, I, I don't know if you have seen the uh, statement of Azerbaijan's presidential administration, but their uh, statement actually clearly said that there was some progress in the talk. So let us talk to Karabakh mm. Armenians ourselves without any external interferences, be it Armenia, be it anyone else, and mm. listen to their complaints which was happening today again, and their complaints and their demands were met positively from Azerbaijani side. So Azerbaijani government will take steps in order to prov provide them with fuel, provide mm -hmm. them with humanitarian aid that they asked for. So uh, the uh, fuel and heating system for the schools, for the hospitals, and uh, for other necessary mm -hmm. uh, objects uh, for survival, for a living, will be provided for them. So uh, again, yeah. this is the first step in the dialogue. There should be more steps. It's a process. It's a dialogue and they shouldn't be an outside mm. interference into this process. Uh, Arsen, I, I see again you do want to jump in, uh, but I want to get back to the point you were making about Russia. Um, uh, and I want to ask you about the fact that many in Armenia are criticizing what they see as the failures of Russia. Russia brokered the ceasefire. Russia has had a, a peacekeeping force there since in, in Nagorno-Karabakh since 2020. Uh, many in Armenia are saying Russia didn't do enough to protect the lives of ethnic Armenians. Um, how much anger is there right now about Russia? I mean, there are protests in front of the Russian embassy. There is, uh, of course, the society is shifting in, in its uh, maybe understanding of what the Russia's role has been and is. But I'll get to that, of course. I mean, two things that need to be uh, straightforward and clear. Uh, you're talking about uh, our, uh, the, the Azerbaijani guest is talking about both roads being opened. It's simply not true. Yes, Lachin Corridor was opened two or three times just to allow some people with critical care needs to be moved out by the Red Cross. But nothing was allowed to come in, as you well know. Uh, well, you're talking about opening a, a road, and, and that's it. You, you, you're simply stuck. You're either taking it, take it or leave it, is what we're hearing from Azerbaijan. I mean, this is very much a continuous uh, policy of ethnic cleansing. I mean, you're making a condition, a situation for the people in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which, are, which are so unbearable that they don't imagine how they're going to be living with Azerbaijanis and under the Azerbaijani state. I'm not even going to get into the rights issues and stuff. Right now, while the Yevlach negotiations or the first meeting in Yevlach was happening, Sepanakep was being shelled. We were seeing bombs. And while the talk was happening, I mean, can you explain why you were doing that? On the one hand, you're calling the people to speak with them. And at the same time, you're continuing to send shells, even near the hospitals, the civilian infrastructure. I mean, Azerbaijani soldiers are inside, almost inside Stepanakert, and people are thinking, OK, well, next thing is uh, tomorrow night we're going to wake up and we're going to see Azerbaijani flags here. I mean, this is forcing your way in and keep uh, creating a situation where people have no other choice but to ask and beg for evacuation. I don't imagine uh, in this situation, within these conditions, as, as nice uh, packaging as you can try to give us, I mean, people are devastated, people became homeless, mm. people not had basic supplies, uh, let alone medic medicaments and other things, for months now. Mm. And now, after scaring them by shelling their living areas, you're telling them, oh, reintegration, that's what's going to happen. It's all great. Take it or leave it is what we're hearing, basically. And mm. you're pushing out our, our population of Nagorno-Karabakh by every single step that you're making, as much as today the footage was coming out that Karabakh Armenians and Azerbaijanis met. And you, you quoted, and I'll finish it here, you quoted uh, Azerbaijani president's office. Indeed, you said that, oh, this is one of the many meetings. I'm not sure if many meetings are going to happen if we continue seeing and constantly being worried about finding our kids. Right now, what I'm seeing 
on social media whenever they have internet in Karabakh, in Nagorno-Karabakh. People are asking, have you seen mm. this guy? Have you seen this boy? Have you seen my parents? People are lost. People have no information. People don't know what is happening. Their communication is cut off. Their basic supplies are cut off. And they feel like next thing is going to happen, it's mm. going to be an attack of massing everyone. Uh, Matthew, let me ask you, um, there are those questioning if Russia will actually be able to play an effective role in peacekeeping going forward. And many have suggested that Russia is simply too stretched because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, what do you say? Well, you know, as much as my government and I personally locked horns with my Russian counterparts on Georgia when, when Russia invaded Georgia in August of 2008, uh, I, I worked very well with them when it came to mediation of the Karabakh conflict and found them to be professional and creative, including Foreign Minister Lavrov, even including President, then President Medvedev. Uh, and the peacekeepers, uh, I think, um, ha are basically performing their task. The peacekeepers' mandate is not to intervene on the territory of Azerbaijan. Karabakh is part of Azerbaijan. The, pe the peacekeepers, their mandate is to come in to locations as Armenian military forces withdrew. That's what the uh, November 9, 10 ceasefire statement said. So until there was this, this clarification that there are no more Armenian affiliated military forces in Karabakh, um, it wasn't in the mandate of the Armenian, of the Russian peacekeepers to go in there. Uh, they don't have a mandate to, to, uh, of peace enforcement. Their mandate is not to stop Azerbaijan from taking what it believes is a, a legitimate security operation. Pe they're not peacemakers, uh, they're peacekeepers. And so uh, I'm hoping that now there is a peace that's going to be kept uh, and that the Russian peacekeepers will provide a sense of security uh, for, the, for the Armenian um, community that mm -hmm. will remain in Karabakh, however big or small it may be. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Esmira Jafarova, Arsen Haratyan, and Matthew Bryson. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here. Bye for now.